thing I thought we could start off talking about this morning is sort of your call to ministry. So your story a little bit. Um, so your calling into ministry, mm-hmm. your your relationship with the Lord through college, things like that, um, what you were doing, and then ultimately how you got to Utah. Why was this laid on your heart? Mm-hmm. And, and sort of how did that play out in you yeah. coming to Utah? Well, uh, the Lord's been very gracious and uh, His... His work of grace throughout my life is pretty pretty obvious. Uh, I would uh, be completely, uh, it would just be totally inappropriate for me to not start with that mm. and thank the Lord for His, for his grace. Um, I was brought up in a Christian home. My, my dad served as a minister of music in the church where I grew up in, Randolph Baptist Church in Randolph, Mississippi. And my mom was my first Bible teacher I remember uh, her reading Bible stories uh, to my brother Kevin and me when we were growing up. And then in uh, in 1979, I was eight, and uh, heard a sermon in in our church from a uh, uh, at a revival meeting that was scheduled. And I realized that uh, uh, I was a sinner, really for the first time. I was only eight, but I realized that I did wrong things and that uh, I needed God's forgiveness and grace and that's only in uh, in Jesus and his person and work and I certainly didn't know all of the theological details at that point but I knew I was a sinner and I needed a savior and the only one available is Jesus and so uh, I that night uh, after I got home I asked the Lord to save me and uh, then a few years later when I started having some opportunities to make choices on my own uh, I kind of felt, <clears throat> not on purpose, but I just fell into a pattern of I was I was uh, kind of shaped and who I was with determined what I was doing mm-hmm. and my attitude and that sort of thing. But I couldn't live like that. It didn't work. It didn't work because I knew that, you know, the gospel is true. And, and to live as if it's not true when I know it is true just didn't work so uh, after a time that didn't work and uh, some some real difficult uh, times of conviction and crisis led to um, I remember you know the prayer Lord if you'll show me what you want me to do I'll do it Mm. and I in my prayer even included I don't know how this is going to happen but but if you'll show me make it clear I'll do that and I told you that my dad was involved in music ministry, right, so right. I got involved in that. I went to, uh, then you know, finished high school, moved to Nashville, Tennessee, studied music education at Belmont University, um, and uh, while there, started working a, in one of the local churches, Neely's Bend Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee, and that turned out to be a major uh, moment in my life. Because it was there, I met uh, my wife Hope, and uh, her dad was the pastor, and so uh, um, Bill Williamson, Bill and Jackie Williamson, had a big impact on me, and so I was watching him do ministry, and I remember him, um, the very first time I was there, uh, talking about the book of Isaiah, and how it was the gospel of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and and uh, even that just, just kind of piqued my curiosity, right. and he was... Um, you know his his Bible preaching kind of uh, really <clears throat> drew me to the value of the Word of God, and through music ministry there that expanded and other things. And I even as as the music part was expanding, so was a love for the Word of God and desire to learn it and uh, to see the value of teaching it. Right. And um, was involved in a, a music group called Walk by, Walk by Faith with my brother. Kevin Waldrop, and then a friend of ours that we grew up with, Mark Ritchie, and and we did that a good bit. We were pretty busy. Uh, I think the busiest year we had, we were at like 150 something different, wow. mostly church services. Wow. Um, but we knew we either had to do it a lot more, <laughs> or do it a lot less. We couldn't <laughs> work jobs and, right, and continue right, to right. do that. But we also, at the same time, were all feeling the conviction that. You know the local church is the place where where God is is calling His people to be and to work mm-hmm. through that. 
because it's in the church, according to Ephesians 3, that God is demonstrating the, the, the mystery and showing his manifold, manifold wisdom and the mystery of the gospel. Implications of that mystery come out. And uh, so I ended up going back to school after through, through my father-in-law's influence um, <clears throat> and others. Um, ended up going to Mid-America Seminary because I was feeling the call to, to preach and teach and uh, do pastoral ministry. And so um, through that, I learned that a lot of ministry is going on in the southeastern part of the United States. Yes. And not very much in the rest of the world, uh, even the rest of the country. Sure. So early on in seminary, uh, I started, I had a sense of, I would like to go somewhere where there's not a lot of, where, where there's a need mm. for further gospel witness. And that, you make an argument that's everywhere, right. of course, but then you can also tangibly see there's a difference in uh, how many churches are in certain parts of the country or parts of the world and other parts. So... Uh, Hope and I both agreed that that that's something we were were interested in and pursuing God's call to some place where there was not a lot of gospel witness. Uh, we thought that would be international, mm. but uh, uh, through a, a series of providential events, it ended up being St. George, Utah, and, and um, the fact that this area is, uh, according to evangelical. Christian standards, St. George, Cedar City, I-15 corridor is, uh, by some statistics, some measures, the third most unreached metro area in the United States, wow. and the other two are also in Utah. Oh my goodness! So we have a we have a great opportunity here. There's a great need, and and that's one of the things that uh, drew us here. And uh, this is a place where you can see the impact of making the gospel clear sure. when people understand the gospel. So, so that's. That's hopefully a, a brief yeah, answer to the whole thing. <laughs> right. And so both of us, me growing up in Texas and, and you in Mississippi, <clears throat> both of us studying some in the South, um, doctrine of salvation is kind of a hot topic, a big issue, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. with Calvinism being almost a dirty word. Right. And right. so by God's grace, one thing that I would say almost all of the members at Desert Ridge seem to agree on is the doctrines of grace, and so how did how did you how are you influenced by the doctrines of grace? How is that playing out in Desert Ridge? What convinced you of it, and what were some of the areas that you struggled with the most um, in affirming the doctrines of grace? Right. You know, the I think the most crucial factor is my understanding what the Bible is, mm. and. The Bible is the Word of God. Uh, that's that's probably the crucial truth that I understood from growing up at Randolph Baptist Church. All my Sunday school teachers, uh, we had discipleship training uh, and uh, Wednesday night children's and youth ministries, RAs that I was involved. Uh, there was a consensus of all the people at Randolph Baptist Church that the Bible is true. Mm, praise the Lord. It's inerrant. It's infallible. <clears throat> we can trust the Bible, so that piece is the is is what is I guess the most crucial uh, factor in my understanding grace. Right, right. So even though that piece was in place, uh, I was not used to thinking in terms of uh, the way that the doctrines of grace are articulated historically in Reformed theology mm. and and in what's called Calvinism. Or what's rightly called Calvinism. Sure. Um, I, you know, just as a a little disclaimer, <clears throat> much uh, I would disagree with much of what's uh, generally understood to be Calvinism in the popular sense because I don't think it's accurately descri right. describing Calvinism. I'm absolutely not a hyper Calvinist and consider that a separate theological commitment, which right. is. Uh, just uh, untenable biblically mm. and uh, antithetical to uh, what, for example, Charles Spurgeon understood to be Calvinism and and other uh, other Baptist uh, leaders in years past. But because of the my commitment to the Bible as the Word of God, 
when I um, experienced some crisis over, you know, who is doing what in salvation. Right. Is salvation a situation where God has uh, written a blank check or just kind of opened the gate mm. and he's standing back to, to see who might come sure. in? Or is is salvation the work of God through the ages, his overarching purpose of redemption, uh, uh, redeeming a people for himself? Right. You know, who is the author of eternity? Is it man collectively and God mm-hmm. just has to deal with that? Or is it God and all of creation yields to God's plan and purpose? And so, so uh, <clears throat> because of my commitment to the Bible, when I was... Uh, <clears throat> struggling with some of these things and some of my friends Keith Sanders Jody Anderson uh, Mark Ritchie and my brother Kevin Waldrop we we were uh, discussing these things I'd say Keith kind of uh, came to Keith and Jody maybe came to to see what the Bible said about this first um, they were at Mississippi State University and apparently somebody donated a box of John MacArthur cassette tapes <laughs> and uh, he they listened to that some, and uh, Keith also got into an introductory uh, Greek class mm. for some seminary along the way. <clears throat> and our conversations were not always uh, happy, right? <laughs> um, as I was, uh, I was simply against the notion of what I thought Calvinism was, right? And, um, that but, misunderstanding that you were talking right, about before, I, I, yeah, I. I I included some things in my perception of it that are not accurate, uh, but also I needed to be corrected in some in some things. You know that uh, that what God is doing is is not <clears throat> here's an offer to mankind, take it or leave it, but rather He has a specific purpose and plan to do what He's doing. Right, and nothing can stop Him from doing mm-hmm. that. So when I, but but the factor was when I decided I got to put away all the other things to study get my Bible, what does the Bible say? And I really was motivated to prove that it didn't say what Calvinists were saying that it right. said. But what I discovered uh, throughout was that God indeed is sovereign over salvation mm-hmm. and, and no sinner um, <clears throat> no sinner would ever uh, initiate salvation uh, to the glory of God. Right. Only God would initiate salvation to the glory of God. So... Um, uh, so that the Bible is what led me to that conviction. Now you mentioned Desert Ridge, yeah, Desert Ridge Baptist Church. Our statement of faith is is rooted in historic Baptist confessions. Um, it's mostly uh, following the template of the uh, the Abstract of Principles, which is the original statement of faith for the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary at the very beginning in the mid 1800s mm-hmm. but we also drew from the uh, the London Confessions of Faith from the 17th century the 1644 and 1689 uh, so we're our statements of faith include what uh, what particular Baptists were committed to you know and have been committed to for hundreds of years and more importantly than that way more importantly than that uh, we're committed to what biblical Christianity right uh, requires as doctrine because of what the Bible says. Right, so building on the Bible and um, sort of a, a great foundation of uh, historical confessions of believers yes. that affirm the same doctrines. Right, and that's important because if you come up with the doctrine and you find that nobody in the history of Christianity has ever believed it, right. you're probably off. Right, <laughs> right. probably missed something. So, And it's a joy, you know, it's a joy to be able to celebrate Grace mm. with uh, the the RBC family and and uh, not not everybody's uh, you know at the f- same place regarding that. There's some deep, difficult truths involved sure. in that, and so um, <clears throat> if anybody should be patient about that, it would be me, right? Because it uh, it took a process of uh, of really understanding what does the Bible say before before I was ready to say, you know what. Um, this reformed doctrine of salvation is is true, not because I choose it over other theological options, but it's simply undeniable from mm. Scripture. Mm. I think that's great, and that, that's really where it came 
uh, down to for me is, is am I going to believe what the Bible says mm-hmm. or am I going to allow my theology to interpret the way that I read the Bible? And I wasn't sure. ultimately comfortable with that. Right. Um, but I think that's great. I, praise the Lord that you're in Utah. So we kind of saw how you got here uh, through God's grace. Mm-hmm. Um, now with, with a little bit of our statement of faith, kind of the, the theological makeup um, of Desert Ridge. And so sort of in our, our time closing, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the things that you're excited about in the life of Desert Ridge uh, in the direction that it's heading? Right. Well, you know, one of the great things about the doctrines of grace and understanding that God is sovereign in, in uh, salvation is it frees uh, His people to focus on clarity, you know, to focus on um, making the gospel clear. Mm. And that's what, in, in a couple of different places... I think it's very crucial to understand this. Ephesians 6, uh, verses 19 and 20, and then Colossians 4, 2 through 4, Paul asked for prayer, and uh, in, the one, in one of them he, he emphasized boldness. Mm. Boldness, and he says, he used the word ought to, which is the phrase ought to, which is how I ought to speak when preaching the gospel. And then the other one he talked about making the gospel clear, which is how I ought to speak. So he put those together. He asked for prayer, for boldness, to make the gospel clear, and I think we have a great opportunity because there's the you know the average person in St. George or most people in St. George hear the word gospel a lot. Right. Uh, this is a very religious town. You know, um, I, uh, James Hazelton, a good friend of mine, pastor at the Narrows Church, um, passed on some information that he found where three out of four people in St. George attend some type of religious meeting wow. regularly. Wow. Wow. Um, and so there's lots of of Christian sounding language going around, but we have to define it accurately. Mm. You know, gospel. What is gospel? And you know, biblically, the word is good news. Sure. The good news that um, though God will not lower the standard which we could never meet, He has in fact met the standard for us in the person and work of Jesus. And so that's a very good. Very good news, Absolutely. of course, and and so we have. I think that's the most exciting thing. We have an opportunity with some stability because we we don't feel compelled to run after what the world would say is success. Um, we can rest in God's grace, and then just uh, be about boldly making the gospel clear, mm. and see the impact and exactly how that will glorify God in our context, and to do so. Bill's great relationships, fellowship, you know, to do that together. So I think we have a great opportunity um, to just live together for the glory of God in a place that needs to hear the gospel. So I'm most excited about about that and seeing the growth that that uh, comes through that. Awesome. awesome. That is very exciting. 